Good afternoon, and welcome to the Sydney Writers' Festival in this session, the long and short of it. My name is Kevin Rabelais. When the question of length arises in fiction, particularly brevity, I always think of the wonderful American short story writer and novelist James Salter, whose books include Last Night, Burning the Days, and Light Years. It was Salter who once said that shorter works, that is, short novels, novellas, and slim novels, are the most grueling for the writer. The shorter works are to the writer, Salter suggested, much as middle distance events are for the track and field runner. Like those middle distance foot races, the shorter form in fiction demands that every step count and therefore be accountable to the work as a whole. This afternoon, we are fortunate to have three marvelous writers with us. Each has written novels. With their latest books, however, they have turned to shorter forms, short stories in the case of Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie and Robert Drew, and the short novel or novella with Amanda Laurie. After the session, our guests will be signing copies of their books in the Glee Books bookstore, located, near the, located in the Ruth Cracknell Room. Uh, near the end of the session, I will turn things over to you. There will be time for a question and answer session. I ask in advance that you keep your questions brief and ensure that your questions are, in fact, questions. And I'll thank you for that. Uh, now, please join me in welcoming Jim, Amanda, Robert, and Amanda. Our first guest, Amanda Laurie, was born in Tasmania and lives in the north, north, uh, northeast coast of Tasmania. Her first novel, The Morality of Gentlemen, was published in 1984. She has since published two other novels, The Reading Group and Camille's Bread, which received the Australian Literature Society's Gold Medal and the Victorian Premier's Literary Award in 1996. Amanda Laurie is also the author of The Philosopher's Doll and two quarterly essays, Groundswell and Voting for Jesus. Her latest book is a short novel titled Vertigo. Please welcome Amanda Laurie. I was just having a good look at the audience, see how many people I know. It's always very important to check that out to see who's here to know if you're telling any lies. Um, I want to begin by addressing the phenomenon of the bedside table, uh, the reader's bedside table. Most readers I know always have a, a stack of books by their bedside table, often very long books. And each of those books they've opened up and they've read about 50 pages and, and they think, oh, that's interesting. I'll come back to that. And they never do. Then they think, well, I've paid for that book. I'll lend it to a friend. They give it to a friend a month later. They say, did you read that book? And they say, I started that book and I'm going to finish it. Um, and there's this little underlying guilt syndrome because we've all been brought up to finish whatever we start. Now, in defense of short forms, of course, there is no guilt. You start the thing, you finish the thing. You often read it in one night. If it's a collection of stories, you can at least read a story in a night. So I don't know about you, but the minute I pick up a short book, I'm relaxed. All my old guilt syndromes have dissolved. But more seriously, I think, um, I think the short form is a kind of marvel, an aesthetic marvel. And I, I, coming up here, I was making a list of my favorite books, and I realized how many of them were novellas. Uh, by which I mean something somewhere between 20,000, which is a short novella, and 60,000. The Great Gatsby, for example, is, um, I think, 50. And one of my favourite short books, Brokeback Mountain, is less than 12,000 words. So much in that book doesn't even make the 12,000. Now, a lot of books are cluttered with too much information, too much detail. I find. Now this may be age. I may be getting very impatient as I get older and I suspect that's true. I think when you're a young reader it's all new, it's all fresh and you have a different orientation. But for me now I find a lot of books are too long and I find they have a padded out feel. Um, and I really think in fiction especially detail should only be there on a need to know basis. Strictly need to know. 
Too much detail, too many words actually obscure what's important rather than illuminating it. The other thing, of course, in storytelling is that too much of anything breaks the spell, and the spell is everything. You know, it's why we read. We want to be enchanted. We want to have that spell cast over us. Uh, So the writer has to be so careful that that spell on any given page is never broken. So you get immensely talented young writers, I find, who also kind of segue off into discourses on their favourite subjects, you know, Japanese gardens or whatever, um, or they'll lapse into an elaborate backstory of some minor character. It's not important. We don't care. It's like, get on with it. Um, and if you, read, if you go back to Breakback Mountain, I'm sure many of you will have read it, you, you will be struck by the fact so many writers would have turned that into a novel, turned that story into a novel. Ianni Prue had the sense to condense a novel into a short form to get the intensity, to maintain the focus, to keep the spell. The minute, if she had padded that novel out with all kinds of background detail and description, it would have lost its force. But there is, I mean, there is as much in that 12,000 words as there, and more indeed than many much longer works. Now, I had a lot I wanted to say in Vertigo, short book, very short book. Um, so I made it as short as possible. And that's not a joke, it's a paradox. But it means that I wanted to maintain a certain magic. I wanted it to be about city people who moved to the bush. I wanted them to experience that extraordinary hit that D.H. Lawrence describes in Kangaroo, where you think you know your landscape, but once you're actually living in it and positioned in it, you suddenly become disoriented because you realise you know nothing about it. And that's the vertigo of the title. So it had to be very, very precise. And to help me along uh, in this, I collaborated with a great friend who's a leading Tasmanian artist, uh, Lainey Biggs, and she has actually produced eight um, small photographs of landscape uh, in this um, particular work, which is a little unorthodox, um, but I think they're exquisite. And they are part of the text, they're part of the spell. But I also wanted to say something about how I came to write Vertigo because it grows out of the very strong tradition in Australia um, of short forms. I think uh, there's some masterful practitioners of the short story in Australia. I don't have to name them. One of them sitting on the stage here. Um, It's something Australians do particularly, well, not only Australians, of course, but it is a very powerful tradition in our literature. Um, And... I was living on the northeast coast of Tasmania in December 2006 and we had a very big, a very serious bushfire. Not on the scale of the Victorian bushfires, but nevertheless it wiped out one town near me and threatened several others. And the only reason there were no deaths was that we were living on the coast and of course people could run to the water, which in Victoria was the one thing they could not do. It's another reason we love the coast. And people... uh, it, uh, people were able to stand in lagoons or, or on the rocks. Although that, even that often is quite fraught. Some of you here may remember a Sussex Inlet fires where people ran into the ocean and the radiant heat was so hot that people who had backpacks actually melted them into their skin, if you remember that. Um, so Henry Lawson had written one of my favourite short stories, The Bushfire it's called, not unexpectedly, um, and it's kind of Romeo and Juliet's story. It's a wonderful story. It's very Lawson. It's very sentimental, very hard piece of writing. Wonderfully done. All the big themes about Australia at the time, the squatters, the big pastoralists and their clash with um, the small selective farmers. And the daughter of the big pastoralist falls in love with the son of the, the small farmer and the fire comes. And Anyway, I won't spoil the story. You can read it. It's online. Um, and I was thinking... If, we, if I wrote a bushfire story now in modern Australia, contemporary Australia, what would have changed since Lawson's time? Um, so for me, the book began as a kind of doodle. I knew it would be short because I wanted to emulate his concision and his economy and his restraint. And I kind of looked around where I was living. and I mean, once upon a time, 30, 40 years ago, it would have been all sheep and cattle. Now it's olives and uh, walnuts and vineyards and boutique cheeses and alpaca goats and the whole landscape has changed. But in addition, 
there is that phenomenon of the sea changes who've all come into the coastal towns and completely transformed the demography and the local politics. So I took a young couple out of Sydney who can't afford the mortgage and who also have a particular loss, which I'm not going to tell you about, spoils the plot, um, and they move to a small town on the coast and they get caught up in this bushfire. So immediately we're in the territory of the pastoral, which is that wonderful form, literary form that goes back literally hundreds of years, where city folks are jaded uh, and they yearn to return to nature. They yearn to reconnect with the ground of being. They have this idealised idea of the country. It's all going to be wonderful. They're going to get away from pollution and high-rise and corrupt city councils. And when they get there, it's going to be peace and harmony, which, of course, it never is. It's, it's, there's plenty of conflict. It's just that in the country, it's more in your face. Although there's not an awful lot of transvestite prostitutes in the country, I must say. But, but there's other problems. There's, there's your local plantations that are aerial spraying and the runoffs poisoning your water with pesticides. So there's a lot to deal with. So the young couple move into this kind of magical landscape, this extraordinary Australian bushland that Lawrence described as having the weirdest beauty in the world. Um, but he also captured that disorienting vertiginous beauty of the Australian bush. So that you think you know who you are, you get into it and you realise you don't know anything. So the pastoral form is a kind of fable. It's a fable about all that. And a fable is like a fairy story. It can't be too long or it becomes a realist documentarian novel. You know, it becomes War and Peace, which is a wonderful book. But um, the fable is a kind of magic story and it must be precise. It must maintain this. It must cast the spell. It must maintain the spell and it cannot go on too long. So I got to the point where I knew, OK, you could develop these minor characters, you could develop subplots, you could do all sorts of things with this material, but it would be a mistake. Stop now. And I did. Thank you, Amanda. Our next guest, Robert Drew, was born in Melbourne and grew up on the Western Australian coast. His first collection of short stories, The Body Surfers, was published in 1983 and is a contemporary Australian classic. Robert Drew's other prize-winning books include memoirs, Walking Ella and The Shark Net, and the novels Our Sunshine, Drowner and Grace. In 2006, he served as editor for Best Australian Stories, and he has also edited several anthologies, including The Picador Book of the Beach and The Penguin Book of the City. His latest book is a collection of short stories titled The Rip. Please welcome Robert Drew. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I jotted down a few um, of my beliefs about the short story vis-a-vis um, the position of the short story vis-a-vis -vis the novel. Um, and always when I think about um, the essence of the short story, I think, that, think of that Ernest Hemingway's famous six-word offering, for sale, baby shoes never used, which is a tiny but I think a wholly realised piece of fiction. It fulfils most of the requirements of a much longer story. It evokes strong emotion and it instantly captures the reader's imagination. <clears throat> but more than that... It seems to answer something deep and special in our nature. And this, for me, is what makes uh, a genuine short story. Some essence of the reader's own experience has been dredged up and extrapolated. So for a few seconds, some temporary sense has been made of our common journey towards birth, between birth and towards oblivion. You read it and a small explosion takes place in your brain. And that's the test for me of whether a short story works or not. It's that small explosion. Whenever I read short fiction, I'm waiting for something to detonate. That's what tells me when I, that I've stuck, struck a well-told story. It doesn't have to be tragic or violent or sentimental, especially not sentimental, but you should think even subconsciously, wow, that strikes a chord. I have something in common with this. Now, does the novel accomplish that? <clears throat> Only intermittently, um, at the best, 
It's a pretty hard, it's pretty hard to stretch out an anecdote over several hours or days. And I think that explains the power of short fiction. It seems more natural to us than longer fiction. Someone is telling us an anecdote, a yarn, and we listen. And once, you know, once more, we're just a, tri a, tri a tribe of humanoids gathered around the fire as night falls. One of the cavemen says suddenly, you know, that saber-toothed tiger over the hill, guess what happened today? And all the men, women and children hunker down in their bearskins and, and listen. And they give the, the speaker their full attention. <clears throat> so the tribesman's fireside tale, the reminiscence, the anecdote, the long drawn out joke in the pub are actually the basis of the short stories we write and read. More than novels or plays or films, even more than television, they seem hardwired into our social behaviour. When we tell each other about things that happened, stories in other words, even the most amateur raconteur emphasises particular details and edits others. You know if you're repeating a story or something you heard when you get home at night, you tend to eliminate the more boring bits, emphasise the more interesting bits, and in fact turn it into um, a, a, a better rounded narrative. And all the time with the intention of heading towards a satisfying denouement of some sort. One of the earliest writers of short stories, Edgar Allan Poe, author of one of the very first detective stories, The Fall of the House of Usher, said that the true short story should achieve a totality of effect that made it impossible to summarise or paraphrase. Poe defined the short story as a narrative that can be read at one sitting. So what the short story has over the novel, for me, apart from its sharper focus, is a precise sort of power. It's a type of fiction that seems to speak to each of us personally and in a sneaky manner that seems real. And I think this is the point. It sets up a neediness we weren't aware of before we began to read it and then somehow satisfies it. I think that's a small miracle. Um, I'm just going to read a short, one of the shorter stories from The Rib. It's called The Whale Watchers. The last time Tom ever saw his father, the humpbacks were migrating north from the Antarctic to spend the winter in warmer Queensland waters. Tom thought whale watching seemed a safe proposition. Otherwise his father and Sonia were just self-consciously hanging around the house, exclaiming at the bird life and picking up magazines and putting them down again. The trouble with living on the north coast was that southerners felt bound to include you in your spare room in their holiday plans. Even their honeymoon plans in the case of his father and his bride. Until he received the wedding invitation, Tom hadn't even known his father had a girlfriend. His father was a quantity surveyor, widowed not quite two years and hitting 60. Sonia was a divorced allergy products salesperson, 45-ish, Tom guessed. They'd met in Bali the year before while getting over their separate sorrows around the pool bar at the Oberoi. After three days in-house observation of the new couple, with four still to go, Tom found it hard to imagine his stepmother being depressed in Bali or anywhere else. Sonia was a vivacious and decorative person. Even her asthma and migraine hadn't kept her down for long, and she'd smiled through both attacks those first two days. The honeymoon was difficult for Tom to get his head around. He didn't know if he and Chloe should be trying to entertain the older couple or allowing them complete privacy. In their presence, he felt strangely impatient and crotchety, as if his and his father's ages and roles had been reversed. At breakfast, he feigned hostly heartiness, poured orange juice and didn't know where to look, just as his father had behaved with him and his overnight girlfriends when he was 20. At night, he heard them murmuring as he was preparing for bed, but thankfully the spare room was at the far end of the house and he was able to block out the possibility of any intimate noises with a series of closed doors. That side of things didn't bear thinking about. I think they're cute, said Chloe. He's not your parent, Tom replied. Anyway, his father and Sonia were just driving through on their way north to Port Douglas, heading for two weeks on the Great Barrier Reef and presumably as much privacy as they wanted. Before whale watching, Tom suggested lunch at a beachside cafe, the Undertow. It was full of young backpackers sharing pasta in various accents, admiring their new tans and repeatedly counting out their money in heaps on the table. Isn't this younger generation growing much taller than us oldies? Sonia said loudly. It doesn't matter which country they're from, even the Asians, they make me feel like a midget. What nonsense, said Chloe. What are you, five nine? Five nine and a half, said Sonia, the same as my hubby. She fondly patted his bald patch. He's five eight, said Tom, unless he's grown since I was a boy. 
Let's order, shall we? His father said. He squinted at the name badge on the waitress's breast. He left his glasses behind. What do you recommend, Stephanie? Shoshani, said the waitress. It's all on the board. <laughs> Calamari's off. <clears throat> Over lunch, Sonia loudly admired the artwork on the cafe walls. Amateur representations of sunsets, dawns and rainbows over Mount Warning. Busily took note of the artist's names on a napkin and only nibbled at her prawn salad. Before Tom and Chloe had finished eating, his father already had his wallet out, waving away any opposition, but then landed in a credit card disagreement. As Shoshani kept saying, the cafe accepted only Visa and MasterCard. Shoe shine, I must say I find that unacceptable, said his father, waving his platinum Amex. Is there anyone in authority I can speak to? Sipping the dregs of her mango smoothie, Chloe had a coughing fit then, and she and Tom avoided each other's eyes. Tom ended up settling in cash. His father was still seething when they reached the Cape, and Tom parked the car. They hiked along the steep coastal path to a cliff below the lighthouse. His father and Sonia deliberately fell behind, and when they caught up, his father's mouth was drawn tight and he was breathing heavily through his nose to cover his puffing. He looked a little flushed around the gills, Tom dimly remembered some paternal health warning sign four or five years before. His mother had insisted on dietary, tobacco and alcohol changes. No one had dreamt she'd go first. Chloe and he waited until the older couple caught up. Sonia had her arm hooked in his father's. Outdoors with her flying blonded hair and pink cheeks, she suddenly looked years younger, buoyant and allergy-free, and surprisingly at ease in the elements. Southerly winds whipped the tussocky grass, buffeted their faces and made everyone's eyes water. The surly Pacific lurched and rolled towards South America and crashed on the rocks below. In the distance, a lone feral goat flicked into sight, skittered improbably up the cliff face and disappeared, a mere blink later before Tom could point it out. He inhaled the misty wind, exhaled, inhaled again and sighed, less deeply this time. OK, he thought. He touched his father's shoulder. What about this, Dad? Impressive or what? Most easterly point in Australia, his father read from a sign. His eyes sought another sign. Do not climb on the railings, he read aloud. Parents, watch your children. Darling, keep a look out for whales, said Sonia. I am. I can't see any, his father said. You've got to keep looking, Chloe said. Look towards the south. Suddenly one pops up unexpectedly. You'll see it breaching or blowing. Possible rock falls. Keep inside the railings, his father read out in a louder voice. As if you wouldn't, he scoffed, if you had a modicum of bloody sense. Tom told them to watch out for the rare white humpback known as Migaloo that appeared off the coast every year. Wouldn't you think he'd be called Moby Dick, he muttered into the wind, to no one in particular. He'd go outside the railings anyway, his father said. Only the Jap tourists taking their bloody snaps. You'd be asking for trouble, slippage, rock falls. He gripped a nearby railing and attempted to shake it. It moved perhaps a millimetre. None of this looks too stable if you want my professional opinion. Why would you name a whale after a restaurant, mused Sonia. She beamed. Just asking, have you been to Moby Dick's? Nice seafood, but fairly pricey. <laughs> his father was shaking his head in wonderment. Wouldn't you think some bright spark would have cottoned on to printing the signs in Japanese? They all huddled together on the cliff as the southerly gusted into their faces. For a long moment, no one spoke. Brrr, shivered Sonia. Come on, you whales, she called brightly, like a soccer mother urging on her child's team. She jogged on the spot for a moment to get warm, then reached out and smoothed Tom's wind-ruffled hair with both hands. She patted his shoulder. There you go, stepson. Thank you, wicked stepmother, he said. <laughs> Better keep your eyes on the sea or we'll miss them, said Chloe. When you two have finished larking about, we might get on with the business at hand, his father said, pointing at a foamy chasm below. I saw something big just then and you two missed it. They don't come that close into shore, Tom said. Probably a dolphin, said Chloe. This is a popular spot for dolphins. I saw a dorsal fin. Could be a shark, his father said. It'd make it worthwhile if it was a shark. Sonia asked then, Darling, did you look like Tom when you were young, dark-haired and wiry? What? I don't know, probably. He frowned and jerked his coat collar around his chin. Yes, I did, back when I was six foot two. Why do you ask? <laughs> Just wondering. They're very alike, Chloe said, your chap and mine. Mum always used to say that, said Tom. His father pulled his collar higher against the wind. His jacket looked new, a fashion choice for a younger, hipper, perhaps, perhaps bigger man. The shoulders slightly overhung his own. I think we'd better head off a bit earlier than we thought, he said. We'll make tracks and hit the highway this afternoon. I'd like to make Brisbane before tonight. Sonia looked slightly surprised. 
He doesn't like driving at night anymore, she said. Look, said Tom, suddenly pointing out into the bay. There's a whale. There's whales where we're going, said his father. Thank you. <laughs>